It's a poem about, it's a poem about how, when I, how I first learned to read. And it was in Liverpool. It was during the war. And uh, these were blackouts. And uh, there were no books around, really. There were no libraries. Libraries were all closed. There were no bookshops. But my mother was very resourceful and taught me how to read. Learning to read during the war wasn't easy, as books were few and far between. But mother made sure I didn't go to sleep without a bedtime story. Because of the blackout, the warm, comforting glow of a bedside lamp was not permitted. So mum would pull back the curtains and open wide the window. And by the light of a blazing factory or a crashed Messerschmitt, <laughs> cut, cuddled up together, she would read sauce bottles, jam jars, <laughs> cans of sardines, and my all-time favourite, a tin of Ovaltine. <laughs> so many years ago, but still I remember her gentle guidance as I read aloud my first sentence. Sprinkle two heaped teaspoons full of... <laughs> I did learn to read. <laughs> um, thank you. As I got a bit older, still living in Liverpool, and there were more restaurants, and I, this is one I went into, and it's based on a true story, when I came across got an infamous Liverpool villain. Uh, he was known as the Toxteth Terror, actually, and this is a meeting with him. The poem's called Greek Tragedy. Approaching midnight and the Metze unfinished, we linger over Greek coffee and consider, consider calling for the bill. When suddenly the door bangs open and out of the neon starry sky falls a day's giant. He stumbles in and pinballs his way between the tables, nicking ringlets of deep-fried calamari en route. Nikos appears from the kitchen, nervous but soothing. Double moussaka, grunts the giant, and two bottles of that red cena muck. He gazes around the tavern, now freeze-framed. No tables are empty, but none are full. You could have broken bits off the silence and dipped them into a tarama salata. Then he sees me. I turn to a rubber plant in the far corner and try to catch its eye. <laughs> he staggers over and sits down. The chair groans and the table shudders. I know you, don't I? He says. Lily the pink and all that crap. Here, I'll give you your autograph. It's not for me, it's for my nephew. Sign here. I sign the crumpled napkin as if it were the Magna Carta and hand it back. Then to my girlfriend, I say, over cheerfully, Tom, we were off, love. While peering at the napkin as if I'd blown my nose into it, he threatens, you's not going nowhere. On cue, a plate of cheesy mints and two bottles appear. Flicking our hands from the tops of the glasses, he refills them and looks at me hard, very hard. Do you know who I am? I do, but pretend I don't. Eddie Mason. Call me Eddie. Cheers, Eddie. Do you know what I do? I do, but pretend I don't. <laughs> I'm a villain, living on the edge, a bit like yourself, you know what I mean? I don't, but pretend I do. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the people business, like yourself. Lest I'm a doubting Thomas, he grabs my hand and shoves a finger into a dent in his skull. Pickaxe. I feel that, and that, and that. Brick. Hammer, knife, screwdriver, baseball bat. He takes me on a guided tour of his scalp. A map of clubs and pubs, doorways and dives. Of scores settled and wounds not yet healed. What he couldn't show me were the two holes above the left eye where the bullets went in a fortnight later. Shot dead in the back of a cab by the father of a guy whose legs he'd smashed with an iron bar. He hardly touched his moussaka but ordered more wine, and it goes without saying that he shredded the napkin and left without paying. This is, um, again, you, thank you.